Welcome to this edition of Valor Media. This is episode number 77 for July 26th, 2021, and I'm your host, Mark Appenzeller. Today, I am beginning a conversation that I actually want to continue in next week's episode, because today I want to talk about a topic and give you a little bit of backstory and provide some relevance for it. And then next week, I want to examine how this thing plays out in our life and how it can wind up not only being a blessing to us, but to others as well. Now, I'm entitling today's episode, Belonging. That's kind of a broad and maybe obvious sounding term, belonging. Now, it may even sound a little corny to you, but sometimes when something seems really obvious and we have the inclination to be dismissive with it, we're kind of doing a disservice to ourselves because a little bit farther down the road, we might discover that there are some missing pieces and we may not really be able to put our finger on what they are or on how to get them back. So I think it's important today that we really talk about this idea of belonging because let's face it, for really all of us, if we were honest, belonging is a deep need. As a human being, we all want to belong. We all want to be accepted. We all want to be part of something. And so it becomes a lot more complex when you frame it in those terms. Now, belonging at its core definition is about relationship with other people. And when we go into relationship with other people, we do so influenced very heavily by our personality. Every single one of us is uniquely created. We all have an individual, distinctive personality. We may have similar personality traits to somebody else. We may have common interests with somebody, but there's nobody else on the entire planet who has our personality or our life experiences. And we bring those two things into the equation when we go on the pursuit of of this vague thing called belonging. How does that all play out? Also, because our personalities are an influencing factor, the way we engage with other people will be different. Now, my wife, who is a very fun and very funny and very intelligent person, somebody who loves people, she actually tends to be kind of shy and a little bit introverted. And if she engages in a social setting, where she's talking to a lot of different people. She can have a great time, but it takes some effort for her. And when it's over and done with, she can feel a little bit depleted. She can wind up feeling like she needs some alone time to sort of recharge her batteries. I tend to lean more in the other direction. I'm a lot more extroverted. I can plug into a setting and I really enjoy conversation and dialogue with other people. And it's kind of invigorating to me. So we're sort of different places with that. But depending on what's going on in life, there are times that she leans a little bit more my way and other times that I lean a little bit more her way. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're one of those poles or maybe you're somewhere in the middle. The point is, it's not a cut and dried thing, belonging. It is a very different definition for each one of us and so it should be. But belonging is something that we really pursue. And if we're not pursuing it, we should pursue it. But we need to do it in a healthy way. We need to have a very clear mindset about what belonging should really be. And, you know, whenever I talk about belonging or I think about belonging and being accepted, I invariably go back to my childhood. I was very blessed to have a childhood in which I really felt a deep sense of belonging. I was born in 1965, and I have some pretty vivid memories of the late 60s when I was a little kid, and that was a great era to be a kid. There were some incredibly cool toys, there were some really fun and interesting cartoons and TV shows, and it was just a very, very different time. Part of it was that, and part of it was also the fact that I was blessed to grow up in a small suburban neighborhood with a lot of small houses with families who had a lot of kids. Now, I was, again, a little kid in the late 60s. 
But my brother was seven years older than I was. So he was in that good age range where he was old enough to understand things and do things. There was a family down the street who had six kids. Their oldest son became my brother's best friend. Their youngest son became my best friend. And in the middle of all of that, there were so many kids who were coming and going from our house. My mom kind of wound up being the cool mom of the neighborhood. Now, it wasn't exactly the Brady Bunch, but it was a pretty idyllic environment. My mom was very intentional about providing a safe, welcoming, fun environment for kids to come over and play. She always wanted to make sure that everybody had something to eat and drink. And we had so many things that were a magnet for the kids in the neighborhood. We had a sandbox, which was a lot of fun until somebody got sand in their eye. We also had a really small hill in our backyard. It was really just more of an embankment. When you were a kid, it looked huge. It was just big enough that when there was snow on the ground, you could sled. And in the summer, you could do another very 1960s activity and take a piece of corrugated cardboard to actually slide down the hill on the grass. There were always birthday parties going on. I just have this vivid recollection of the sound of kids' voices and laughter and singing. It was really a great time and a great place. And in that environment, although I was only mildly aware of it when I was little, there was another interesting dynamic that was very much a product of those times, and that was clubs. It was a big thing in the late 60s when you were a kid to form a club, to be a member of a club. And on the street that we lived, which, believe it or not, was called Sunnyside Drive, there were various clubs. My brother was rubbing elbows with a couple of them that he didn't form but was a member of, and then there was a club that he did form. I remember a girl across the street formed a club that was called the Friendship Club. There was also a club that was called the Arts and Crafts Club. My brother, to this day, still has some remnants, some little artifacts from those clubs. They were membership cards and things that were very important to a kid in 1968. Well, my brother and his best friend, they wound up creating an extremely unique club. Now, you got to remember that the 1960s was the era of the spy. The James Bond films were really coming into play. And on TV, there were shows like Get Smart. And there was a TV show at the time that was called The Man from UNCLE. And it was about these two spies who worked for this organization. And the acronym for the organization spelled the word UNCLE. I don't even remember what that was supposed to stand for. Well, my brother, one year for Christmas, got another 1960s thing, a cardboard playhouse. It was basically these large corrugated cardboard sections that went together to create a structure. And on the outside of it, there were all of these different graphics representing spy stuff. I remember there was a bomb with a lit fuse coming out of it. There were daggers and pistols. At the one end of it, there was a full-size graphic of a man and a woman spy, and they were wearing fedoras and trench coats And their faces had a cutout so that when you were inside the spy house, you could push their face up and stick your face out. But I remember as a parody to that Man from Uncle TV show, there was a picture on the one wall of a very sinister looking character and underneath him it said Crunch. It was spelled with a period after each letter, I guess mirroring the uncle idea, where it was supposed to be some spy organization. We have no idea what that was supposed to stand for, but it was the Crunch Spy Organization. And so that became the Crunch Spy House. And out of that, my brother and his best friend developed an entire club that they called Crunch. It was a spy club. Now, my brother and his friend were always interested in math and science, so they didn't simply play spy. They were heavy-duty about this. My brother would take books out from the library on secret codes and ciphers, and he and his friend would develop coded messages they would send back and forth. I actually remember my brother reaching a point that he was able to decipher codes, crack codes. They immersed themselves in this stuff. 
My brother had a chemistry set. They were always pursuing doing homemade electronic things. I remember years later, my brother built a telegraph key from scratch using copper wire and junk laying around the house, and you could actually transmit Morse code from one key to another. It was unbelievable. But that was the Crunch Spy Club. And my brother and his friend in that amazing 1960s environment engaged in that. But all of these clubs, Crunch and the Arts and Crafts and the Friendship Club, they weren't 28 kids grouped around the sandbox. They were small groups that you were invited to join or that you founded. You were a member of a club, and that counted for something. Because the clubs were a time to really come together around a shared interest, to take the time to build things, to create things. And it was very much about this investment in doing things in a structured way. I remember they were very big on rules and regulations. And I guess in 1968, if you were 12 years old, that really made you feel grown up. Well, that left a lasting impression on me. But the very same week that man landed on the moon, the family down the street moved 10 miles away. And there were various changes over the next couple of years. And suddenly, friends, although we still remain friends with them, no longer lived on the street. And there were no longer all these kids coming and going from the house. And the whole dynamic was completely different. And by the time my best friend and I wound up in the mid-70s, becoming the same age our brothers had been when they did the spy club, we were kind of aching to do the same thing. We lived 10 miles apart, but we wanted to go back and revisit all that stuff our brothers had done. And we poured ourselves into it. And a lot of what we did was very fun, but it was never going to be what our brothers had because it was never going to be on that street again. It was never going to be in the 60s. It was never going to be in that environment with all those other kids. And so despite our best efforts, We could never duplicate what they experienced. It was gone forever. And that was kind of a weird feeling. But I finally did sort of realize that, that it felt like we were trying to resuscitate this thing that simply could never exist again. And it's because they were a product of their time. And the clubs, whether it was the spy club or the arts and crafts or the friendship club, it was those personalities, it was those people It was from that time. And when that time was passed and when those people moved away or things changed, it could never be like that again. Now, I say all of that because so many years later, looking back and thinking about that idea of belonging and being part of something has really caused me to look deeply at my connection in the body of Christ. Now, maybe you are a Christian. Maybe you're not. Maybe you've heard the term body of Christ and maybe you're confused by it or you don't really understand what that connects to. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've made him the Lord and the Savior of your life, you are a member of the body of Christ. You are connected to every other man and woman on planet Earth who is also in relationship with Jesus. And what's amazing about that is, even though it comes through us putting our faith in Jesus, it isn't about us doing something. It's about what he has already done. And we become part of something despite what we would ever be able to cook up on our own. You know, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 are the verses that I would pull out of all of Scripture as the ones that most deeply touch me, and impact how I live my life. It's the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Ephesus, and he says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I want to talk a lot more about that next week and about this idea of the role that we play interacting with each other. But this idea of the body of Christ, it is the deepest and most meaningful belonging that any human being can ever experience. 
we can all join clubs, even as adults. We can become part of a hobby group. We can go and spend time with people who have shared interests. I've certainly done that over the years. I have a lot of creative interests, and I've been blessed with having many wonderful relationships with people who have those same interests. But if you're coming together just around an interest, around a human pursuit, it can only ever go so deep. The connection that exists in the body of Christ is people who are actually drawn together because they are part of him. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talked about this in a different way. He said, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. It's this idea of partaking in the fullness of Christ. And I'm saying all of this to you today because I don't know where you are. Maybe you are not a believer in Christ. Maybe you are. Maybe you feel completely alone and you feel like you will never fit in anywhere. You are desperate to find meaningful relationship with other people and you don't even know where to start. Or maybe you are a believer and maybe you've been through situations in a setting that were damaging to you and you feel like you've lost trust even for other Christians. I encourage you to think well beyond the definition of church being a building where you go and sit for an hour and a half every Sunday. The church of Jesus Christ is his body. It is every person who is believing in him. And that's an incredible thing. It's tough to wrap your mind around, but it's a level of relationship that is so pure because it comes from him and it can only be about, through, and of him. It's just like when my friend and I, years after all of that stuff in the 60s, we tried to go back and somehow create what we never could because that was a product of that specific era. It wasn't that our brothers created the era. They simply benefited from a time when there were all these kids interacting together and certain things were going on. That had changed by the time my friend and I were older, and we could never make that happen. The body of Christ is something that happens not because of what we're doing, not because of what we're earning or what we're accomplishing, but it comes through relationship with Jesus, which in turn opens us up to relationship with everyone else who is trusting him as Lord and Savior. Maybe today you feel really alone. Maybe you want to be able to connect. You have no idea where to start. If that describes you, you can reach out to us at info at thevalorcenter.org. And somebody from our team will get back in touch with you. We want to not only answer your questions, but offer some alternatives to you to trying to just figure it out on your own. One of the things we offer through Valor Ministries is personal development coaching. It's an opportunity for you to interact one-on-one with a coach that can not only help you to examine some of the areas that you're struggling with in your life, but to help you establish realistic goals and help you find healthy and practical boundaries for forming relationship, for interacting with other people, so that you can live a full and abundant life. Many of these concepts we also teach through our life development classes, which you can join in person or via Zoom. I also want to point you to a resource, a book that was recently published by our executive director, Lori Reston. It's called You Were Made to Thrive, Seven Strategies to Move You from Crisis to Thriving. You can find it and its companion workbook on Amazon.com, or you can go to www.valorxl.com slash products. If there are topics that you would like us to discuss in this podcast, things that would be beneficial to you, that would be an inspiration and an encouragement to you, please reach out to us at media at thevalorcenter.org. You can learn more about the vision and the mission of Valor by visiting our websites www.thevalorcenter.org and www.valorxl.com or check out our Facebook pages. Valor Ministries, and Valor Excel. Please like and subscribe to this podcast. We publish a new episode every Monday. And if this is a blessing to you, would you consider blessing us? 
Would you financially assist us so that we can continue to bring you this kind of content? If so, you can make your tax-deductible donation securely online by going to www.thevalorcenter.org and clicking on the Donate button, or you can send a check or money order to Valor Ministries, 324 East Antietam Street, Suite 104, Hagerstown, Maryland, 21740. Thank you so much for joining me today. We really do want to connect you because nobody should live alone. Nobody should ever feel isolated. You were created as a unique individual, and God wants you to have thriving, healthy, life-giving relationship. Please come back and join me again next week. I want to talk a lot more about this. I want to talk about how this participation as a member of the body of Christ really plays out. There are amazing benefits, not just for us, but for others as we share in being that body of Christ. Thanks again. Please come back next week. Until then, remember this. You were made to thrive.